That's a good idea. We don't want all the people who came arrived on time to have to wait too long for the latecomers. Okay, so um, welcome to the October evening program of the North Coast chapter of the California Native Plant Society via Zoom. We can thank Zoom for this. I'm Carol Ralph, currently president and some of our other officers are here. Andrea, who's our moderator, very important person, is also our vice president and on our wildflower show committee. Uh, Gordon Leppig is our workshop chair, but we don't remind him of that too often, but we appreciate him being around. And Karen Issa is our um, merchandise salesperson and I must say uh, has put more sweat into our nursery operation than most people. And I saw Larry Levine is here. Larry's our webmaster and does some publicity and most important, he's our delegate to the state CMPS chapter meetings. Um, if there's any other people f f who have titles with us, is Chris Beresford here? Anybody f from, um, anybody else from our nursery? Don't, I don't see it, okay. So uh, we're just a handful of the many people that run our chapter and every single one is important. And at, at this point in our in-person meetings, I would call your attention to the yes, I would like sign up list that we pass around so that you can volunteer in our chapter too. <clears throat> and it will give you choices of how you can help and what you'd like. So um, there are choices. One of the choices is about helping at the nursery. And another is if you'd like email notification of our events. And if you'd like advice for your garden, if you want to put native plants in and you don't know what plants you have and you want to know and you want to know what would grow there, we have our native plant consultation service. And um, you can find information on all those things on our website. Okay, so you want to be sure you know where our website is. You probably found your way to it so that you could be at this meeting. It's northcoastcmps.org. Then uh, while I have you all, I'll say that just we just learned that we need to be finding a new program chair, the person who organizes these programs for us. And uh, it can be a team effort. And it's certainly worthwhile. We have all these fun programs. So if you're interested in that, contact me by phone or by email. Um, I think everybody here knows what CMPS is. So uh, let's move on to interactive part. Have you seen any good plants recently? Has anybody been outside and seen any plants that they'd like to share? If you do, if you have, then uh, the procedure is you click on your chat and you, you uh, send a chat to, I guess, to everyone, and Andrea will intercept it and call on you, and then you unmute your mic and you can tell us. That's the plan. So while you're figuring that out, I'll tell you the plant that delighted me the most in recent times was the roadbank fern along our driveway and in my front yard, which is the Polypodium californicum. No, Polypodium Calariza, which um, is summer deciduous. So it waits until the first rain and then it'll start uncurling its fronds, putting up new, fresh new fronds. So it's kind of like the first flowers of spring, but it's the first green thing sprouting in the fall when winter's coming. And they're pretty soon the whole bank of the road will be covered with fresh green fern fronds. So and Andrea, do we have any chat questions or sightings? 
So um, the only person to pipe up so far is Rob and Nita. Oh, well, sure. They're allowed to, to tell us. Yeah. Uh, You're muted. All right. Sorry about that. Um, there we go. We were up on Mount Tamalpais in Marin County um, last week, and which is a great place for wildflowers. A lot of the images in our book came from Marin County. And the uh, California fuchsia is in bloom. And we saw quite a bit of it, actually. It was just growing right out of the rock. I mean, it just, it was just bright weird. red. Yeah. Isn't that something? When everything else is so dry and it comes out with that brilliant color. Yeah. Yeah. And we also great. have it in our, we have a wall with native plants on it and that's been blooming as well. <clears throat> Okay, it looks like there's another chat. I don't see one yet. It's, it says two, so I thought that meant a second person. Yeah, it was just a comment earlier. It wasn't a plant sharing sighting. Ah, okay. So Chelsea Kiefer, haven't you been out and seen a plant? Hi, Carol. Well, maybe this. Um, okay. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm in uh, Lake Tahoe working for the Forest Service. And right now we are mapping uh, white bark pine, Pinus albicollis populations. So I've been climbing to the tippy top of mountains and hanging off cliffs today. <laughs> Great. But not really, not much is flowering right now. Well, white bark pines are interesting. It doesn't have to be a flower. <laughs> I was reporting a fern. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's good to hear. Okay, I guess we better move on. Or Carol Woods? Anybody else want to, to share something? Last chance, you'll have to practice the unmuting and the chat stuff so we can have more, more observations reported. Okay, so um, I'm going to announce the upcoming events. In November, we're going to have a field trip. This is my first um, attempt at doing a field trip with COVID rules applied. But, um, and we're gonna to go to Big Lagoon County Park where you can see um, sand plants on the dune part of the spit. And you can see freshwater plants along the edge of the lagoon. And you can see the spruce forest with um, mossy, mossy forest floor things below it. And we'll look into Big Lagoon Bug from the edge. And Big Lagoon Bug is what we're gonna hear about at our November evening program. So the, the field trip is on November 7th, no. I forget the date, it's the first Saturday. And then the second Wednesday is when our speaker, Joseph Saylor is going to tell us about saving Humboldt's Big Lagoon Bog because uh, Big Lagoon Bog, it's a, it's a botanical landmark place. It's an important place and with um, good plants and an unusual habitat. <clears throat> and it's recently had um, kind of a facelift trying to set back succession. And that's what we'll learn about from Joseph. So I hope you'll join us then. The, uh, the talk will be announced on our website and there will be a link there the same way you got to this one. 
Okay, and you should know that if you um, are in the Arcata Eureka area and you need some native plants for your garden, you can get some anytime because our nursery stocks some shelves at the um, Neyland Glen farm stand, which is right next to our nursery, and they sell them for us. And that's on Myrtle Avenue, just uh, the Arcata side of Eureka. Okay. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna let Gordon Lepig introduce our speakers and Gordon can tell you how he has become familiar with them. Okay, Gordon. Gordon, you need to unmute. Is. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, there you go. Yes. Very good. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Gordon Lepig, a senior environmental scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in Eureka. And it's been my responsibility for the past many years to work with a dedicated team of department scientists to evaluate the threats and development adaptation strategies that address climate change and sea level rise on the North Coast. So I can say that climate change is not an existential threat. As it is often called, it is absolutely a grave global environmental and humanitarian crisis. It's also been my pleasure to work with Rob Badger and Nita Winter a little bit on their floriferous book, Beauty and the Beast. This wonderful book, Decades in the Making, um, uh, addresses head on the threats of climate change to the California flora, but it also shows in exquisite detail the beauty and diversity of this flora, basically how much we have to protect. Their photos and Rob and Nita speak for themselves, so with that it's my pleasure to introduce them to the North Coast chapter and thank them for all their hard work on behalf of the California flora. Thank you both for being here tonight. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for that nice, really nice introduction. It was certainly a pleasure working with you. And the essay that the short story that you contributed to our book is so important. So we're so grateful for everything you're doing and everything that you've done to make our book a success. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Your tax dollars at work. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> doing, doing something positive, right? Thank you. So we're going to share the screen now so we can start our presentation. All right. Um, do you want me to start? You want to start? I can start. Okay. So we want to thank everyone for showing up. Uh, we're always grateful to be presenting to a CNPS audience because there's so much more of a background that people have and understand about what we've actually done and what we've actually photographed. And this book would not have been possible without the uh, participation of the California Native Plant Society. Not only the state office, but so many wonderful people, CNPS members that we met uh, along the way. There were flowers that we found because people from CNPS said, you have to go to this location. You have to find this flower. So um, like I said, this our, our book could not have been done without the help of, of, of CNPS and all its members. So thank you. And CNPS uh, State is a co-publisher of this book, Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change, which is a companion to our traveling exhibit and is now a eight medal award winning book. And um, we also are very pleased to announce that last month we received the 2020 Ansel Adams Award for Conservation Photography from the Sierra Club. So we were really, really thrilled to get that. And we're gonna take you on our 27 year journey to, to um, that led to the creation of this book and project. Well, this all started in 1992 
when the uh, Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve was having a really, really good year. I was at a, at a film processing lab and met a fellow photographer who's, who said, hey, Rob, did you hear that the Poppy Reserve is really going off this year? I said, well, the Poppy Reserve? She said, well, I'm sure you've been there. You're a, you're a California landscape photographer. I said, no, I haven't. She said, really? Well, you, you have to go down there. So this was probably in April. End of, of April. Yeah, the end of <laughs> April in 2000, no, in 1992. So what made this an especially good year was that this year there were a lot of the purple bird's eye gilia that were interspersed within the uh, California poppies. So it made a really beautiful color palette. So I went down with Liz and another photographer friend of ours and uh, we got down there and I, it, it was just amazing to see uh, the wind move through like waves across this beautiful landscape. So that evening af after I had done some photography, I called Nita and said, you really, really, really have to see this. You and I have never seen anything like this before. And uh, we need to come down here quickly because who knows if the, uh, if the uh, air is gonna get hotter and it's gonna wilt the plant. So I drove up and got Nita and we came back down and we spent a couple of days photographing in the Antelope Valley. So that's what started this off. And Rob and I both grew up on the East Coast uh, the Northeast, and we certainly don't have flowers like we do, uh, wildflower spreads like we do in the deserts here. So it was, it was very new and we were, we were hooked when we saw this. So um, for those of you who might have to leave early, we wanted to let you know that you can learn more about the book or purchase it at wildflowerbook.com. So wildflowerbook.com is, um, the website for the book itself. The image on the left is a uh, chia that we got in, I think, Joshua Tree. And the image on the right is a California mountain lady slipper that we drove all the way up from the Bay Area to around the area of Quincy uh, just to get this one flower because we, and so this is when someone from CNPS told us about a specific flower we, we really wanted for the book. So Rob and I met 34 years ago, we just celebrated our 34th anniversary in a photo lab. I was a people photographer at the time and celebrating diversity with, within communities. And so it was interesting to move into wildflowers and celebrating biodiversity. Rob's focus was on nature photography, it was his main focus. And over the years, we decided to team up and work on this project, Beauty and the Beast, Wildflowers and Climate Change. So um, people asked us, well, how far back does the wildflower photography go in the book? Well, this is the earliest image of wildflowers. It was taken in 1984. At that time, I was mainly a landscape photographer. I was looking for some beautiful sunset images of the buckeye tree. I came across this and there was all these pretty purple flowers. I had no idea what they were. And I said, well, I might as well include them in the, uh, in the whole scene. It makes for a better composition. So this is the oldest image in the book. It was um, made in 1984, but we didn't start doing this seriously until 1992. So as Nita mentioned, um, when she met me, I was a landscape photographer. I've been doing that for already about 25 years. And I really wanted to do something more with my work than just take beautiful pictures and hope to get them in the Sierra Club or books and things. So I was fortunate to uh, be hired by the Trust for Public Land. And I worked over the years on 33 different land conservation projects they had. They would send me out to, to photograph uh, privately held land that they intended to convey in, into the public land system. So this, this land is in the Sierra foothills. It was privately held ranch land that 
that the Trust for Public Land conveyed into Sequoia National Park. And because of our relationship with TPL, we were able to um, get uh, Will Rogers, who was the um, former president, he just left um, TPL last year, to write a wonderful story for our book on the, on the importance of public land. So I had been doing a, a lot of photography related to a, a, a environmental issues, uh, mining, logging on public lands, um, water issues, and I, I was just getting burned out from going to see all these, all, all these just you know all these scenes that were just depressing and brought tears to my eyes. So, you know, my commitment was to do something to show the beauty that we had on our on our public lands and we were and i decided to do this through wildflowers and as i mentioned i was a people photographer but even before i became a professional photographer i was a, a wildland uh, firefighter and i was stationed up in leggett working for the state which is now the now cal fire and that was a um, pile of land moving tires that had caught fire. And I kept a uh, camera on my belt and was able to take this picture. The image on the right is the um, Children of the Tenderloin series that launched my career in creating healthier communities. I also did a lot of work for the Children's Defense Fund um, out of Washington, DC. And wonderful artist Taya Schrack would hand color my work for their calendars and also did a series um, called the Faces series uh, initially Marin City and then different communities around the Bay Area to celebrate the diversity and we created seven foot banners that hung in the streets and then I ran into some health issues so I had to stop doing the people work and I decided um, over time to start going out more and more with Rob to photograph the wildflowers. So uh, this was one of the first big backpacking trips we took into the Carson Pass area, which many may know is south of Lake Tahoe. Our understanding is that it's the convergence of a lot of e ecological zones. So we were there photographing a whole lot of the of uh, wildflower diversity that we found up there. We were probably about 9,000 feet. I was carrying 85 pounds and Nita was carrying 65 pounds because we were car carrying camera uh, equipment and all the equipment I used to uh, uh, light the images that I'll show you later on. And then we also had to bring up food. So this is Lake Winnemucca up by Carson Pass. And I decided I was never going to carry 65 pounds again up the mountain. Um, but Rob, on a regular basis, would carry 65 pounds. And the reason I was doing that was because we wanted to photograph the flowers safe and sound in the ground where they lived. We, our project could have involved just going to botanic gardens and and, show, and photographing the different species there. But uh, part of the joy was going to where these flowers live and being able to sit with a flower for a while and watch everything that was going on all around us. We heard birds singing, we saw buds. It was just a wonderful experience to, to spend time with the flowers out in their native habitat. And one of the ways we were able to afford to do this was we were able to sell our artwork to art consultants and architects that were working on healthcare facilities. And this is a eight foot tall by 20 foot wide lobby divider in um, a Kaiser Redwood City Medical Center. And it was one of seven dividers. Um, each floor was a different color theme. And we had, I think, a total of 34 images built into the architecture, which was really fun. So we were always trying to put wildflowers in wherever we could. Uh, this particular image is part of the contact series that I did where I can actually get a flower petals in contact with the lens. And I'll talk 
uh, about that later. It's a very, very different way to photograph individual wildflowers. That's another one. This is actually flocks that we photographed in uh, Point Reyes National Seashore. So it wasn't all about doing strictly botanical close-ups. And when the flowers weren't available, we would go out and photograph birds. And uh, I've had a number of these images go into medical centers as well. We consider birds flying flowers anyway. <laughs> So people asked us, um, one of the most frequent questions people ask us is, what is the favorite wildflower bloom you've seen and where was it and when was it? And so in 2003, above the town of Gorman in the Tehachapi Mountains, um, there was an incredible bloom of wildflowers Interstate 5, uh, when you leave Los Angeles and you go up and over the grapevine, you come to the town of Gorman that sits about 4,000 feet. Down at the freeway level where the flowers started uh, and then up to the top of the ridge where the flowers continued was about 1,000 feet high. And these flowers extended for a mile. So we were seeing wildflowers that were just completely covering the landscape. Uh, it's something like we had never seen before and the hardest thing to do was settle on a composition sometime because everything was so, so breathtaking and just, you know, we just wanted to sit there or stand there and just watch these things. And they called this a 50 year bloom and Rob had been driving past that area for 40 years and could vouch that it had never been anything like this. And so the foreground is public land is Hungry Valley State Vehicular Recreation Area. On the far side is private land that we're hoping someday will become uh, protected. And down below is where Highway 5 uh, goes. So you're looking east. And uh, we got there at the tail end of the storm. Clouds were clearing. There were these beautiful patches of sunlight that were showing through the breaks in the clouds. So again, the hardest thing sometime was to, you know, just do one composition because everything besides it being so beautiful was also changing right in front of us. And so our approach was to not only document what was out there, but to make art of it as well. So that was our first most incredible bloom. Our second one was actually just a few years ago, 2017 at Carrizo Plain. And it was known as a super bloom. When we started out in 90, uh, our first um, 100 year bloom was in 1998 in the deserts. Seven years later was the second 100 year bloom. Because of climate change and the swings in rain and drought, we were, they were finding that there were more and more of these uh, <clears throat> great blooms. And instead of calling them 100 year blooms, they started calling them super blooms. So this is the uh, Tembler Range on the east side of Carrizo Plains. Um, and on the other side, further east is Bakersfield. And this is the Caliente Mountains, which is on the west side of Carrizo Plains. And we had only seen a few desert candles over the 27 years. And here we were seeing tens of thousands of them. And it just blew our minds. It was just amazing. They were just beautiful flowers swaying in the wind, these, these, this intense magenta blossom that was sitting atop this hollow stalk. The stalks just looked like they were, they were glowing. You know, it was, it, it, was, it was just a mesmerizing event. And hillside daisies in the background. And we, uh, on the way back down, this is the view coming back down to our campground. So, so you're looking west, Bakersfield. East. You're oh, I'm east. sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. You're looking east. Uh, Bakersfield would be over the hills uh, in the distance, and San Luis Obispo would be behind us on, on the coast. And that's the Tembler Range. And that's where you saw a lot that year. You would see patches of different colors. 
And this is go ahead. Uh, this is an iPhone image that that Nita took. We counted up and we did a, we used about ten different cameras over over twenty seven years. Started out with film, and in two thousand six, we changed to digital photography, which made macro photography so much easier. So uh, this this was a beautiful detail of what we were seeing. There was so much color there. So people ask us, well, you know, how do you, how do you photograph? Well, the average uh, botanical style image we do, which means everything sharp and in focus, takes us about an average of 45 minutes from the time I finally drop my gear on the ground till we, till we photograph and then pack back up. So there are three types of wildflower portraits that I'm doing, though one in the top left corner is what I call a strict botanical portrait where everything is sharp and in focus and as much detail to show the beauty of the blossom. Uh, we use white or black backgrounds to isolate the plants because often there's quite a distracting background behind what the, uh, the blossom that we're looking at. So I started using fabric you can probably see in the second image down on the left, there are some subtle black folds in the fabric. If you look across the page to the uh, alpine daisies, you can see there's a white fabric that I'm using to wrap the, to wrap the flowers. So I, 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 I developed that because I wanted to add more of an artistic composition to the flowers we were photographing. The third way I photographed, which is a process that I developed. Uh, you can see on the on the lower left is a process called the contact series, where I'm using the camera's lens to touch delicately the flower petals. So what happens is because the camera and the lens is blocking the light falling onto the subject, falling onto the flower, the light that's coming from the background behind the flower is the source of light. So, so I get this beautiful transmitted light feeling uh, that is a very, very nice soft composition. And I do this, uh, unlike the other photographs, unlike the other portraits I'm doing, I do this off the tripod. It's more spontaneous and in some ways it's just a lot more fun because I never know what I'm, get, what I'm going to get. This photo is the one that <clears throat> uh, took us the longest. It was two and a half hours. Back when we were doing film, you might be able to see in Rob's uh, hand is a um, Polaroid. So we used to, with film, have to do Polaroids, so it took a lot longer. And I had actually found these flowers the night before, but it was getting too dark, so we came back um, around sunrise and started to set up and the light is coming from the left and um, we needed to bounce some light back in to the right side and we also wanted to keep the light off the uh, sand and the leaves so that the flowers would pop out uh, better and stand out better and so this was the final result. When it took us about two, two and a half hours and again this was filmed uh, now with digital photography, we can see what we're getting right away. We can see the exposure, we can see the composition. So it's a lot easier to do either portraits or details. So we live in the Bay Area. So we do a lot, of, we've done a lot of photographing in the Bay Area and Marin County in particular has some great biodiversity. So it's been a wonderful place to photograph. And sometimes we'll use plexiglass as a background to allow the light to come through. And we're always photographing where we can access the plants easily without doing damage. And here you can see a black background and then there's also a white background underneath the black. So we may try it in both ways and then decide which one we like better. So sometimes we're just in some real awkward positions trying to get the flower uh, 
and again, if if we can't get it without doing damage to the immediate area, we just won't do it. No, no matter how beautiful a specimen is, and Nita has eagle eyes. She can spot flowers and colors a long way away, farther than I can. So often, Nita will find a flower, and I'll spend the next 20 minutes or half an hour photographing it. So some, so we carried equipment that allowed us to block the wind because in some places we're photographing, especially near the coast, there's a lot of wind. So there was a lot of setup time, but it always gave us just beautiful, beautiful results. So the time was always worth it. It was just a joy to be there. Sometimes the positions were really awkward and I was lucky I could be on the treasure hunt finding the flowers and then Rob was willing to be in the really uncomfortable position um, to get the photograph. And then he'd, off, he'd show me what he had uh, either in the Polaroid or in the um, uh, digital camera and I would give him feedback and sometimes he would have to start from a different angle. So people ask us, well, who took the photographs? Well, the photographs are his, hers, and ours. There's a lot of hours in there. I've done most of the landscapes, and uh, Nita has helped me with a, a lot of the close-ups and done a lot of her own. So this one, uh, Rob packed up. I was in uh, uh, traffic school because I had gotten a ticket. So he came back, we had seen this flower the day before on Ring Mountain in Marin County, which is a wonderful place for flowers. And uh, two minutes after he packed up, it started to pour. But he was fortunate and able to get it. We have a 30 inch print of this in our living room, which we just love the detail. We also try to take common flowers and make something different and capture a different aspect of them. And so we might only take a little part of it. Not only do we see flowers, but we also get to smell flowers. And this one in particular, this is up on Mount Tamalpais on the way to the West Point Inn, if anyone knows the area. Um, and this is the Western Azalea, which is just has an, an amazing aroma. We just love photographing it. So often we'll go through a lot of different uh, images of the same flower to get just the right composition because it doesn't always look the best with the first ones. This was a also up in Quincy area. I'd never seen the Shasta iris, which was really, really fun. And as I mentioned, we, we always photograph um, in an area where we'll do, uh, won't do damage. And so by the side of the roads, by the side of trails, and we always work with natural light. We don't take strobe with us, we always, work with diffusion discs, with reflectors. Um, and by using natural light, we often have surprises. And so we really, we really uh, enjoy that because sometimes the light will change as we're photographing. And we've even had flowers uh, decide to turn towards the uh, reflector. And we've had them actually move out of the frame while we're photographing because they decide they like the light over there. So uh, again, this is part of the wrap series. We photographed this uh, alpine daisy at 11,000 feet in Morgan Pass in the Sierra. And you can see, you can imagine that the background immediately around this flower was just, just chaotic with rocks and it would have been just distracting from the composition of just the flowers. And the fabric that Rob likes to use is chiffon, which is a very fine fabric. And as you can see, there are a lot of rocks trying to hold down the fabric. But if you have the, le the slightest breeze, the whole thing can be blown, uh, blown away and you have to start over. So always trying to get the folds to complement the uh, geometry of the flower. There's another one. 
um, the Alpine Columbine. And it's, these are called the RAP series. And this is um, Ring Mountain again with Mount Tamalpais in the background. And Ring Mountain is one of our favorite places. And we'll show you a photo a little later of the Tiburon Mariposa lily that only grows on Ring Mountain, the only place in the world. Again, this is part of my contact series. Um, and like I said before, it may take a whole lot of images, a whole lot of attempts to get just the right composition. And I've had times when I've tried and tried and I haven't gotten anything, but at least it's fun to try and, and play with what's going on using that technique. And I also want to clarify something. Rob said we'll take a lot of pictures of a flower. We actually don't take a lot of pictures. We will try several different, might try several different yeah. angles. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, in the contact series, it is different and he needs to take more of them because every time the camera moves, it becomes a new composition. So with the contact series, I always have, uh, areas in the in the image that are sharp that are in focus and yeah. then other parts that aren't and then light is a, an important thing as i mentioned earlier we work with diffusion discs and um, reflectors in this case here's an iris that's in sunlight rob using a small diffusion disc up on mount um, Ring Mountain later in the season. And here's the same flower with a diffusion disc so that the light is much softer. And then sometimes we'll do it both ways and decide later which one we like. And people ask us, well, how much Photoshop work do you do? Well, every raw image that we capture has to be processed through an imaging process software so for example in this image the camera saw the actual light that was photographed that was falling on the scene the source of light was the blue sky up above and behind us at the very very top right in the middle there was uh sunlight falling on the uh distant background so the digital cameras capture a very low saturated uh, image and with very, very low contrast. And so what we do in Photoshop is to bring it back to what it was like when we saw it. And especially with doing wildflower photography, what's extremely important to have the colors accurate. And so uh, we, we do our best to, to show people what it would have been like had they been there. So we have um, different backgrounds. Sometimes if the plant's really big, we may just use a sheet. And so you can see the wrinkles. So we will take it into, into Photoshop and clean up the background. So we have a solid white background or solid black background. And this is what the leopard lilies look like in the book. This is the two page spread. And in black backgrounds, we may have a seam because this is very low to the ground, this wild buckwheat. And uh, it was a windy day, so we had a lot of sand we were dealing with as well. So, and then again, the low contrast, the low saturation. So we take it back to what our experience was and clean up the background. And again, what it looks like in the two page spread. So not all of the images in the book were taken in California, uh, such as the one on the, on the left, the uh, starry false Solomon seal. Uh, that was taken in Oregon, but that species lives in California. So there are just a few images in the book that were taken out of state, like Colorado, Utah, uh, Washington, Oregon, where those species were, uh, uh, are still found in the state. So we thought it was fair to do that. And as I mentioned, we deal with wind, we could deal with rain, and we can also deal with bugs. 
This was in Utah, and we had a terrible time with no seams. And they itch worse than mosquitoes. They are tiny. They can get into your ears, your nose. So finally resorted to finding clean underwear and putting them over our heads along with the bandanas to try to keep them um, from finding openings. And unfortunately, Rob, um, spending more time on the ground, had really been badly bitten and was, uh, had over 200 bites on him. So we put up with a lot to make these pictures. But, but it's we, worth it. Yeah. So we had been photographing throughout the West, Western states, and we met someone who was a curator at the San Francisco Main Public Library, and she invited us to do a California-based exhibit, Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change, um, in the Jewett Gallery. And this exhibit ended up having um, 100 images. The map in the back we got um, with the help of CNPS, and we also wanted to show people what we actually use in creating this book from the, the guides to um, binoculars. I use binoculars at times to try to find flowers to see where to go. And also we found these wonderful knee pads. Um, Ergodyne is the company and they um, donated knee pads for us and they were like kneeling in stiff jello, which Made so it much more comfortable. Yeah. Because I tried did it, different different gardening knee pads that didn't have enough cushion in them. So if, if you're out there in your native gardens or on the ground spending much time on your knees, these are really, really nice knee pads to have. And we're really thrilled that the San Diego Museum of Natural History um, is creating a large print version of this exhibit. It's going up next month. And it will open whenever the museum opens again, which we think is going to be in January. And in the meantime, we, uh, this exhibit, um, half of it became a traveling exhibit, Exhibit Envoy. And it's been up at the, in Ukiah at the Grace Hudson Museum and, and uh, many different venues around the state. And over 45,000 people have seen it so far. Nina mentioned Exhibit Envoy. Ex exhibit Envoy is a wonderful nonprofit organization that that brings exhibits to small and medium exhibit venues. So we were fortunate to be picked up by Exhibit Envoy and our show has been traveling for four years now. Yeah, and our purpose was to find a way to educate people um, about climate change, species preservation, and land conservation. And we are using the flowers to attract attention to get people to fall in love and then giving them action steps they can, they can do to make a difference. And so we decided we wanted to do a companion coffee table book to the exhibit. And we wanted to have a diverse group of voices. And there's Gordon on the right there with his cap on. And we found 16 um, scientists, environmental leaders and nature writers to each write a short story, a nonfiction story on a whole series of different topics. And our authors ranged in age from 20 to 82. Peter Raven is on the upper left and he's become a wonderful champion for us on this project. He did the foreword and he did a wonderful short story on the evolution of California's beautiful plants. So it became a very collaborative project. We had many different organizations involved supporting us in different ways, um, either in writing um, stories for the book or helping us promote it. And we're very grateful to all of them. We could not have done this alone. So the book is divided into three sections and the, and the different short stories uh, relate to each section. The first is the gift of beauty. The second is the human connection. And the third is ensuring the future. So this is Gordon's, the beginning of Gordon's essay uh, or story. It's um, called Wildflowers and Climate Change. And um, it really makes, we wanted to take science and make it accessible to people. And that's why we asked people, 
our authors to do it in a storytelling fashion and also people can identify uh, with the writer. Ryan Burnett, who works with uh, Point Blue Science Conservation, is uh, a scientist up north also, and he, his research has been um, how the mountain meadows are being affected by climate change, and especially how it's affecting the Rufus hummingbird during its epic migration from Mexico all the way to Alaska. And if the timing is off, the phenology is off, the plants don't get pollinated and the hummingbird doesn't get the fuel it needs to make the that long a trip. So this was the luckiest image that I have taken in all the 27 years of wildflower photography. This was this is a scarlet fritillary uh, photographed it in Oregon. We had a big huge disc behind it. The flower pro the plant probably stands about three feet tall. It was kind of uh, gently moving in the in the breeze so I was waiting for the breeze to stop I had my eye looking at the viewfinder I had a fast enough shutter speed to stop the movement of the f of the flower uh, I had my finger on the cable release I saw the bird come in I got two frames and the bird left and I looked at it and said oh my god this is great let's wait to see if the bird comes comes back so we waited for almost a half an hour later bird never came back but we got home looked at the image and it was it was just beautiful so uh, this is the most fortunate image uh, great, greatest luck in the whole book and all the time that we've been photographing so we include things about uh, gardens and pollinators this is uh, some information from the National Wildlife Federation. Susan Twite did a story on the five deserts of California. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's also the author of uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, is a Native American botanist and professor in New York. And she wrote this wonderful story in What's in a Name from Linnaeus to what her grandmother called, uh, named the uh, strawberry to, to the DNA. So it's a, it's a really interesting story. So we feel that the stories are as important as the photographs. Wendy Takuda is a retired anchor, news anchor in the Bay Area, and she began doing restoration work and pulling broom and wrote this wonderful story, Zen and the Art of Pulling Broom, and it's very funny. Talking to children about climate change without scaring them. This, uh, the image on the on the left is called the candy flower. We got it at Point Reyes. It's it's one of the most beautiful flowers I've seen. It's got this sort of uh, sil these silvery petals with all the beautiful yellows and purples in there. And Genevieve Arnold, thank you to the Theodore Payne Foundation. We have two stories in there. And she wrote one on seeds, uh, seed banking. There's also a section in the book on uh, fire ecology, uh, wildflower recovery. So we'll show you quickly some images that we've taken after fires have gone through. And it's gonna be really interesting to uh, see what happens this year with four million acres having burned in California. So if anybody knows of really good wildflower recovery this coming year, if we ever get rain, please let us know because we're gonna work on trying to get some funding to document what's out there. This was Lake County. This was six months after the fires in Lake County. And we're just amazed at how much regrowth there was just in the six months and the and the bulbs especially just went wild with this uh, new sunlight and for, uh, being fertilized by the, uh, by the ashes. This field had burned in entirely, and this is what came back uh, in that same area in Lake County. When you looked at the soil beneath these plants, it was all charred. 
And this is uh, Pepperwood Preserve in Sonoma County. You can see there are trees that had burned in the upper left. Uh, again, looking at the soil, all this had just been charred and this is what came back after. Afterward. And this was the Tubbs fire, which was the, the devastating fire in Santa Rosa a few years back. And this preserve has burned twice in the last, I think, three years. So these are some of the close ups of flowers that we found in these different burn areas. And that, that combination of flowers was just the way Nita found it. So we're going to take you a, through a quick uh, trip through the desert one of our favorite areas to photograph. This is Death Valley. And sometimes you don't think there's much out there, but if you keep your eye, eyes peeled, you can find something like this desert broom rape. Mm -hmm. Cam camouflaged in the, in the, petal, in the pebbles. So these images are from Death Valley from 1998, the first 100-year bloom we experienced. So we would go out for three weeks, a month at a time. We also like to try to catch the insects. Then Joshua Tree is another favorite. This was done in film in 1998. So there's interesting ground details, the soil, in some parts of the park is really granitic. Uh, this is uh, canterbury bells in a, in a normal rain year, a few canterbury bells scattered here and there. And then in 1998, uh, on the image on the right, there was so much rain and it lasted for so long that there was an abundance of flowers in the, in the seed bank, in the granitic so soil. Um, that bloomed and because again the rain lasted so long the flowers went to sometimes two and three times their normal height. Even five times. They were huge in some cases. Anza Borrego Desert State Park. This is before social media, so um, it was much easier to come down during a super bloom than it is nowadays. We were in Anza Borrego for 12 days and we had some sort of precipitation for nine days. And so this was a rare, a rare fog in the, in the Anza, Anza Borrego desert. So always trying to find different angles to make things interesting. And again, another favorite is the Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve where it all started. And when we were at Gorman, we came back to Antelope Valley um, and those are those same dark clouds that we were seeing from the other side of the hills. So we're going to just go through a number of um, two-page spreads and we're almost done. And almost all the pictures we've shown you are in the book and there are 190 images in the book. So there are still a lot more images than what you're seeing right now. And it took us 27 years of photography, but three years of working on the book, both in uh, working with all the authors, um, designer. Our first designer didn't quite get our concept. She wanted us to leave all the, all the climate change essays out. And we went, no, we don't think so. That's not the name of our book. So we ended up working with Laura Lovett, who was the um, is on the board of the Marin chapter of the of CNPS. So uh, the image on the left, the, there are two different lilies. There's the uh, wavy leaf soap plant and then the two blossoms on the right hand side are the Tiburon mariposa lily which is found in only a, 
a few populations on Ring Mountain in, in, in Marin County. It's the only place where it's found. It's always fun when you can find orchids. The book has a glossary. We have 18 different short stories with uh, technical terms, geographic terms that the average reader may not know. So we wanted to include that. It has two indices. It has a plant name index. So if you're looking for lilies, you can see where lilies might be found. It's also got a location index. So if you want to know what was found in you know, Joshua Tree, Death Valley, Carrizo Plain, uh, you, can, uh, you, you can reference that to find flowers in those locations. And most of you probably know um, how to get to identify flowers, but we put this in anyway, just in case you didn't. And other people want to know, plantid.net is a wonderful website that was developed uh, by Bruce down here in Marin County which has made it a lot easier for pe people to identify plants. Um, I'm sure you all know about Calflora. And Calscape, CNPS's site, uh, especially helpful when you're trying to figure out what to plant in your native gardens. So uh, we wanted to share this quote by David Brower, Truth and Beauty can still win battles. We need more art, more passion, and more wit in defense of the earth. This is included in the book. So you can uh, go to our website, uh, wildflowerbook.com. You can uh, purchase a regular edition of the book. And we also have a limited edition that's signed and numbered. And the, the book itself, uh, the interior of the book is the same as the uh, regular edition. We have a nice uh, linen cover and it comes in a clamshell case. So that's the deluxe limited edition. And when people buy the regular ed edition, we encourage them to take the uh, uh, paper cover off and look at the uh, hard cover. There's a beautiful picture of a California poppy we photographed out in Point Reyes. So we want to thank you for joining us on our journey for Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. Um, as Rob said, you can find out more at wildflowerbook.com. You can also, and I'll put it in the chat, um, see more of our other work at winterbadger. Dot com. My last name being Winter, Rob's last name being Badger. We really lucked out. And so we are um, thank you, thankful for um, having us tonight. We're sorry if we've gone a little over. Hopefully, um, you're all still awake and there. And so we welcome questions, if you have any. Um, so I see one question from Carol Ralph. Carol, do you want to ask them or shall I read the question? So, so Carol asked, um, do you have any goals to perhaps photograph like all of California's lilies or irises or some other favorite flower? No, not really. I mean, ideally, I would love to get all the lilies. Uh, there are so many different calicordus species that we've seen pictures of. Uh, I, we're, 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 we photograph what we find when we hike and where people send us to. So, but yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really nice question to ask because it's always in the back of my mind if I had an, if we had an infinite infinite amount of time, what would we specialize that we really wanted to show was out there? And right now we're really focused on getting the book out. Now with the with COVID, we've had to adjust and do a lot more of this virtually. We were hoping to be on the road more, but that's not happening right now. Um, 
And we're also looking at creating an audio book for the visually impaired. And we have a friend who is legally blind and we've talked to her about this idea. We've talked to other people who are visually impaired where not only would we read the essays, but we, Rob and I would also describe the images, what the weather was like, what it felt like there, um, and give more information than just the, the, what people would see. And so that's something that we are in the process of trying to find funding for because we think it's a really important uh, population to in, include in, in our message, include in, in receiving our message, and also ex experience what we are experience, what we've experienced over the years, excuse me. Um, so if anyone else has a question, go ahead and, and use the Zoom group chat, enter a question, and I can read it to Rob, Nita. But look, Looks like Ben has a question. Um, do you have any suggestions or tips for backpacking with camera gear? Um, not exactly sure. Ben, if you want to come on, is this a question about um, logistics or um, number one, backpacking with as little weight as possible? <laughs> Always helps. Yeah, which isn't obvious. So, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking if maybe there are some like things that, you know, come to your mind, like that most people don't think about or anything at all. Well, we found that we can actually hike with the knee pads on and that's really helpful because you don't have to go take them out when you want to um, lean over and look at something, kneel down. Um, and we actually found out about those pad knee pads from somebody who was hiking up at Mount Rainier. Hmm. And Mount Rainier is a wonderful place for wildflowers if you haven't been there. And what's nice too is it's at lower altitudes, so you don't have to get as climatized to the thinner air. So I guess the I guess my question would be was what type of photography are you looking to do? Are you looking to do just a general landscape, or do you also want to do floral floral portraits, and you want to go through with with putting a background behind? Because every different version you're adding more and more stuff right yeah so i guess landscapes and then um i also photograph birds as well so um i have like a, a 400 prime lens that i bring with me it's only oh, a five, nice. so it's not uh, it's too big but it's a yeah it's a it, it's a bunch of weight um what yeah. what type of camera are you using i have uh, a 70 a Canon 70D. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I guess the obvious answer, and this is going to be any help to you at all, is just keep your weight down. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, we can't be more, more. What do you think about? Maybe you have an opinion on this. What do you think about the um, extenders? You know, the the multipliers. Yeah, yeah. we definitely. Yeah, use we them. we've used them. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And we also, um, we'll, we'll stack them too. We'll get two um, extension rings. Well, he, are you talking about the two X? You're yeah. talking about the optical, the optical doublers, uh, yeah. as yeah. opposed to the extension tombs that, that lets you get closer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've, we've used them and Canon, God, we've got the third generation of the two X and it's pretty sharp. I mean, you lose, a few stops, but you know, I mean, it just, it just gets you in closer. Yeah. And if people are interested in, in uh, getting in closer with like a 50 millimeter lens, macro, macro lens, you can use um, extension tubes, which are just hollow and, and fairly inexpensive. And Canon has a really inexpensive macro lens. If you have Canon camera, um, a 50 macro, which is really super sharp. And so if you want to get in tighter, you can add an extension tube um, and then you can add two of them if you want. So, and that doesn't take much weight at all. Yeah, the, we found that the macro work really, really slows us down nicely. Uh, you know, we're, we are spending more time going through the landscape in a, um, 
a section at a time as opposed to just walking through looking for landscape photographs. Uh, we were in uh, Joshua Tree photographing a beautiful desert prince's plume. We were there for about a few hours photographing a bunch of different plants and there was this mockingbird that serenaded us for about two or three hours and you know the mockingbird has so many different songs so we just felt like we were being being serenaded there it was just a beautiful experience so the nice thing about macro photography is you really get immersed into the whole area and see all the details so i would encourage you to bring a macro lens if you want to do that Don't doubt that I see there's another question from Sandra. Um, yeah, Sandra, do you want to come on and talk or? Or we could just answer it. Yeah. Um, well, it depends on how far south you want to go. There's, if you want to go all the way to the desert, um, you're talking about February, March, April maybe the beginning of May, um, or Antelope Valley, which isn't quite as far, is um, April, May. But it, every year changes a little bit depending on the, the weather, when the rains came, how warm it gets um, in the spring. Theater Pain Foundation has a great um, resource for what's blooming in Southern California. And you can do it by phone or you can go online and get their reports. And, and, and DesertUSA.com? DesertUSA.com. I don't think they've been as good as they used to be, but, well, um, but yeah. they sometimes also show Northern California. Yeah, they do. Also, if you go to um, CNPS Facebook, sometimes people are uh, posting what's blooming where, so that can also be helpful. Marin County has a lot blooming, um, probably more like March, April, yeah, June. March, April, and May. Yeah. So it, it, it just depends on where you want to go. In 1998, I was celebrating my uh, 50th birthday. And um, that was, this was January 3rd. And because of the rains that had come early, uh, the flowers started blooming in January. It was a really abundant rain year. And so the flowers bloomed all the way into April in the desert. So it just depends on what's happening with the weather, with the storms, the frequency of the storms, how much rain comes. It's, it's just really helpful. Again, we, we, we found that the individual chapter members of where we're thinking of going are great resources to tell us what's going on where and when. Yeah, Marin uh, chapter, CMPS chapter, um, they will on their website be posting some of the flowers that people are seeing. And we found people really um, interested in helping us. So if you want to contact another chapter in an area you want to go to, they seem to be very receptive. Anything else? Um, the last question I saw was, um, do you have any photos focusing on sea level rise? Mm, no. The only photo we have is from out our window when um, we had two inches of rain and high, super high tides and Highway 101 was flooded. So we actually live in an area that is now seeing the effects of um, sea level rise right here in just north of San Francisco. But that's not an area that we've been focusing on. Well, one of the areas that you, that, uh, you know, our, our authors have focused on is what's happening with flowers in the, especially in the alpine areas, where as it gets warmer and warmer, there isn't enough land for them to keep going higher in elevation and there isn't enough soil. 
So eventually they're going to run out of uh, habitat that they can survive in. What's been happening is in these uh, alpine, subalpine uh, wildflower meadows, um, as as the uh, precipitation de de decreases with comp with climate change, and the uh, snow melts melts faster, these meadows are drying out, and the flowers are adapted to the uh, soil moist moisture conditions in these meadows. So as the soil moisture, uh, as, as less and less soil moisture becomes available, they're finding that shrubs and trees from lower down are invading these uh, wildflower meadows. So some of these meadows we're seeing now are, are being taken over by native species as the climate is changing and they're native species. They're not necessarily invasive species, but it's just that the soil and moisture conditions ha have changed. And if people don't mind um, turning their, um, their video on, I, we'd love to see the faces of people who have been listening to us. Yay! Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi! So, any other questions? Well, we may be in touch with you if we get north this year. We're being uh, rather careful about uh, with COVID, so we aren't, haven't been doing any traveling, but hope to go get out. Well, you, you know where to find us. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, We're gonna see if we can get some funding to go out and chase the uh, fire recovery. I have a friend who lives in McKinleyville and he's a naturalist and he leads tours and trips and uh, he's always sending me pictures of kayaking on Big Lagoon. And uh, uh, I lived in Humboldt County. I, I went to Humboldt State for a while. So I have some really, really fond mem memories and love for that area. I mean, there's, there's just nothing like it in the whole state. So thank you for having us. We well, thank, thank you, you for so coming. Much. Sure. Yes. You're welcome. You're welcome. And Gordon, thank you for your essay. It was a really important one for the book. So we really appreciate it. Uh, it was an honor and a privilege. Thank you for asking. Oh, oh you're, you're welcome. welcome. You're welcome. And this was lovely this evening. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm inspired. Oh, good. Yeah. good. <laughs> that makes me feel good. Thank you. Someday we may meet in person. That would be nice. Yeah, if you ever come down this way. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>